15. Thank you so much. It's so uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you all for listening. And it was wonderful to listen to all those previous speakers as well. Um, I want to talk to you uh, a bit about uh, my new book, The Wager. But in particular, I think for today, I want to talk about research and the search for the truth and the way that research can shape a story and change a story um, and how that research can also lead you to places that you would never expect. For example, one day, uh, several years ago, uh, while doing research on this project, I found myself on a small wood heated boat off the Chilean coast of Patagonia uh, barreling through a gulf that is uh, known as the Gulf of Pain. It was storming and the ship was rocking side to side. Uh, all I could see in front of us was this towering wave and behind us another towering wave. Um, it was so, uh, the ship was being tossed about so violently that I did not dare stand. I just hunkered down on the deck. If I did stand, I might break a limb. And in case you think I'm taking a little bit of liberty, uh, liberty um, an exaggeration with the truth, I have a video uh, that I recorded uh, while sitting there, which I can show you now. Now, as you're watching this and as you see the picture of me, you could probably tell I'm not much of an adventure. And I had taken just about every possible remedy to stave off seasickness. I had one of those patches behind my ear uh, and I was dosed on so much Dramamine, I was in a stupor. Um, still, I felt increasingly nauseous as these objects continued to fly past me. There was a bill pump, a jacket, um, and we had not seen another uh, boat uh, or even another soul for days. And I kept glimpsing out the window, uh, hoping to find or see that place that for so long had consumed my imagination, Wager Island. It was on that deserted island that had taken place one of the most extraordinary and gripping sagas of survival and mayhem, one that had influenced philosophers like Voltaire and Rousseau, scientists like Charles Darwin, two of the great novelists of the sea, uh, uh, Herman Melville and Patrick O'Brien. Uh, yet as the boat rocked further and further over, and as the sea swallowed the deck, I began to wonder what perhaps you're wondering now, which is how the hell did I end up in the Gulf of Pain? And the story begins, I suppose, as uh, not too many ones do, back all the way in the 1740s. And it was then that a small little boat uh, washed ashore off the coast of Brazil, on board, crammed inside were 30 men, their bodies almost wasted to the bone. They were so weak, they could not even stand. Uh, but one of them announced that they were the survivors of his majesty's ship, the Wager, and that after journeying some, uh, after being uh, stranded uh, and shipwrecking on a desolate island, uh, they had built this flimsy craft and journeyed some 3,000 miles, completing one of the longest castaway voyages ever recorded. Um, and they were hailed for their ingenuity and their bravery. But then, not long after, another little boat washed ashore, this time on the other side of South America, um, off the Chilean side of Patagonia, this boat was even smaller. It was just a little wooden dugout. It had a sail that was stitched together from uh, rags of blankets. And on board were just three people, including the captain of the wager, who was so delirious he could not even recollect his name. But after they began to recover, they told a very, very different story. Uh, they said that those people who had preceded them and gone to Brazil were not actually heroes. They were mutineers. And in the controversy that followed with these both sides lobbying these charges back and forth, it became clear that while stranded on that desolate island, they had slowly descended into a real life Lord of the Flies, 
with warring factions, uh, murder, and mutiny. And back in England, the principal figures, along with their allies, were summoned to face this court-martial. And um, after waging this furious battle against the elements, um, they suddenly have to wage a war over the truth uh, because they are being accused of committing these crimes on the island. And if they don't tell a convincing tale after everything they've been through, they could be hanged. And so to tell this story presented all sorts of challenges. Uh, first of all, you have a war over the truth. And so I began to look through records and uh, many of them had written diaries. They had written journals. Uh, incredibly, these log books had survived uh, the ex expedition. But I was confounded by how am I gonna tell this story? You know, there's always this illusion that the historian is somehow, um, omniscient, you know, godlike, that, that they could kind of see into every nook and cranny and sort out the truth. But in this case, I was confronted with all these records. Um, uh, and yet each person is shaping their own story, um, manipulating their story, burnishing certain facts and leaving out other facts. They're no longer alive. Uh, I can't interrogate them. And I'm kind of stuck with the records I have. So the first quandary and challenge I found was, how am I going to tell this story? And it occurred to me that the best way to tell it um, would be through the competing perspective of three people on board the wager. And why did I do that? Um, again, um, because I thought it would show the way each of them were shaping their stories, but also the way we all shape our stories, trying to emerge as the hero of them. And I chose to tell the, the book based on the underlying records from the perspective of three people. Uh, one was the captain, uh, David Cheap. He was somebody, he was uh, Scottish. He was somebody who on land was always kind of embittered and frustrated and plagued and chased by uh, creditors and in debt. But on a ship, he had always found refuge. And on this expedition, uh, he had, when they first set out from England uh, shortly after, achieved what he had always longed for, which was a chance to captain his own ship. He was promoted to captain. The other perspective I told it from was that of the gunner, John Bulkley, uh, on the wager. And Bulkley was an interesting figure because um, he was in many ways the most skilled seaman on the ship, but because he did not come from the aristocracy, um, he knew that he could never become a captain. And then the third perspective was told from that of John Byron, who had been a 16-year-old midshipman on the wager uh, when they set sail. Um, and if his name is familiar, it's because he would later go on to become the grandfather of the poet Lord Byron. And um, uh, the Lord Byron's poetry was greatly influenced by John Byron's journal, by what he referred to as my granddad's narrative. And so that is the way I began to structure the story. And of course, it follows their voyage as they set out. Um, and almost everything goes wrong for them on the ship. And these ships were like little floating civilizations with people from all walks of life. And um, first, they have to battle scurvy. Then they go around Cape Horn, um, where they face some of the most violent seas uh, in the world, where the waves could tower over a 90-foot wave. And as you read the records, you're always kind of looking for that anecdote, that gem that can hopefully illuminate it. And one of the anecdotes I found in one of the logbooks described how during the storm, they couldn't even fly their sails because it was uh, so rough and they would blow out. So the captain had ordered his men to climb the mast and to use their bodies as threadbare sails, holding on while the ship rocked 45 degrees from one side and then to the other. And then eventually the wager will wreck on a desolate island off the coast of Chile. It will break apart and about 145 of the surviving members, including the captain, David Chief, Bulkley, the gunner, 
and the midshipman John Byron become marooned on this island. And initially they kind of struggle to build an outpost, but fairly rapidly they begin to descend into chaos and into these warring factions. There is even a class, stru a class struggle on the island um, because suddenly amid that democracy of suffering, somebody like uh, John Bulkley, who could never have been the captain of his ship, begins to emerge as a commander. And one of the things that interested me was even when they are on the island, they're having these philosophical debates about the nature of leadership, um, about the nature of society, um, who should be their commander, or are you your commander because that was your title and because you were born into it? Um, or again, could someone like John Buckley emerge? And they begin to keep documents and petitions because even when they're on the island, they are trying to shape their story because they know if they ever get back to England, um, they will face a court martial for the things they may have done on the island. And so even then they are trying to build this unassailable story to justify their actions. And incredibly, some of them would make it back to England and they get summoned uh, to face this court martial. Um, and for me, what was so interesting in the research and trying to find the themes, because that's partly, you don't really know what a book is about when you begin it. You know, I knew it would follow this voyage, this kind of maritime saga of survival and disaster. But as I was going to the archives and reading these records, um, I was struck by how they were having this war over the truth. And then I was coming home and I was reading our newspaper here in the United States, in New York, where I am now. And I was reading about our own wars over the truth, about so-called fake news and alternative facts. And then I would go back to the archives and I'd be reading these 18th century journals that were crumbling and dusty. And I would see how they were having a war over history and who would get to tell the story. And then I would come home and we'd be having the same wars over, over history and who gets to tell it in our own contemporary times. So I began to find in this strange little story from the 18th century, really a parable for our own turbulent times. Now, as I began and did, spent the first couple of years of my research, I did it only in archives, a place more suited to my very paltry physical attributes. You could probably see some of the records in the, in the, in the camera behind me. Um, but over time, I began to wonder, could I ever fully understand what those castaways had gone through unless I made a journey to the island myself? And so even though this isn't in the book, I wanted to just tell you quickly a little bit about that journey because it would shape my research and it would shape my understanding of what happened. So I found a Chilean captain who had a boat uh, to take me there. And um, initially he had sent me a photograph of the boat and it looked really big. Um, but when I got there, as you can see here, the boat was really tiny. I thought it was going to be the Jacques Cousteau vessel, but it turned out to be extremely tiny. And eventually we set off. And at first, we just kind of follow the journey. We're heading from Chiloé Island, which is about 350 miles north of Wager Island, what is now known as Wager Island. Initially, we kind of follow the journey through these um, channels, uh, uh, kind of protected from the sea. But after about Five days, the captain said to me, well, now we're going to have to go out into the ocean if we're going to get to Wager Island. And suddenly we, we headed out uh, into the unprotected Pacific. And I got my first glimpse of these terrifying seas. And as you recall from the video I had showed you, it was so rough, I just sat there. Now, I'm not the wisest uh, person. I had to figure out a way to pass the time. I didn't know what to do. So as I was just sitting there for about 10 or 12 hours a day, holding on, um, I had an audio recording of, uh, uh, of Moby Dick. And so I listened to it an unbelievable novel, but I do not recommend listening to it in really rough seas. Um, and eventually we head into the Gulf of Pain and we do make it to Wager Island. And here you can see uh, me standing on the island, all kind of uh, wearing all my warm clothing. And um, 
as you can see, I'm so bundled up and it helped give me a better understanding of how cold the castaways were when they were there. They had only bits of clothing that gradually disintegrated. And this island, I needed to understand it. And it remains completely windswept, desolate, barren. It rains almost all the time or sleep. And there is virtually no food on the island. I found here, and you can see in this picture, some celery, which some of the castaways had found, which did uh, actually cure some of their scurvy, but that was about all they could find. And I began to finally, after exploring that island and having the journals with me, it finally really helped me understand why a British captain had described this island as a place where the soul of man dies into him. And so again, even though I never described my journey at all in the book, it was that kind of research, that kind of tactile research and experience that helps inform and breathe life so much into the descriptions. And at one point when we were on the island, uh, one of the people with us, she was the captain, uh, there was a little stream near the uh, where the castaways had built their encampment. He says, look over here, look over here. And we looked into the water and there, uh, just beneath the surface of the water, we could see some wood. Um, and this was timber. They were about five yards long. They were bound together with tree nails, like wooden pegs. And they are from the remnants of an 18th century warship, believed to be from His Majesty's ship, the Wager. We knew what they were because an expedition had discovered them about a decade earlier. Um, and as I stood there, I just kept staring at this little fragment, this little remnant of the ship. Um, because after all those furious warring stories, after all the elements, this was all that remained. And the only sound I could hear was that eternal hush of the sea. Thank you all so much. It was such a pleasure to chat with you.